I'm going to lead today with a story. And as you'd expect from a guy, it's a story about shopping. <laughs> Cast your minds back to the, to the early 90s, just after the Berlin Wall came down. Back then, I lived in Germany for a year, which was obviously amazing. And as part of that trip, I also went to live or to, to, to visit Prague and then later Berlin. What struck me most about those two cities was the contrast, and particularly the contrasting shopping experiences. We'd be wandering the streets of Prague, looking in department store windows, and it all looked very Spartan. Contrast that with West Berlin, and particularly the store Car DV, and we'd see this ostentatious abundance. Everything, every possibility was on offer. The centrally planned system in Prague provided for the basics, clearly. West Berlin, as showpiece of Western culture, provided for every last niche. And it did that by entrepreneurs weaving a complex web from opportunities that either arose or were formed. Actually, truth be told, this isn't a story about shopping at all. It's a story about waste. Why? Well, there's the obvious. Western economies have a whole lot more stuff and so more waste. I don't actually want to dwell on that now. What I do want to explore is this process of developing niches and how that creates an abundance of opportunity, including for waste. And I want to use the department store as an analogy. What I want to put out there is this. Our current tendency to look for centrally planned solutions to our waste problems is holding us back from creating a world without waste. And that the path to a world without waste is paved by entrepreneurs. More on that later. First of all, do we actually have a problem with the path that we're on? I don't know. That's the usual answer. We just, it's just a part of life and we don't think about it. Then when we do think about it, we freak out and instantly leap to guilt. It's wasteful, it's a mess, it's our kids, and the government needs to do something about it. Think about it. The amount of waste is increasing. There are more and more people throwing out more and more stuff. Not only is the amount of waste increasing, it's also getting more complex. It was only a couple of generations ago that there were no plastics of any significance. And it's within this generation that we've had to deal with electronic waste. Finally, try to do anything in the recycling space and you have to deal with commodities markets that are all over the place, and yet the waste keeps on coming and coming and coming. It's a disaster. So what do we do about it? Well, we create systems that are incredibly robust. Think of landfills, think of incinerators. They're robust and they provide a reliable outlet for waste. They just don't add value to waste. So we get nowhere with recycling and then try to force recycling through this central mandate of policies and strategies and plans. It's all informed by a vision, a belief that you can design the optimal recycling system. It's that clever consultant or committee coming up with the right answer. The trouble is, this is all fantasy land. To design within the inherent complexity of waste, you assume away pretty much all the important details, and those details really matter. And that's why we're struggling. For me, a better model is food supply. There is a vast network of operations that brings the bacon and eggs you had for breakfast onto your table. It's a network that has pretty much every layer of complexity you can imagine, and it does so without any outbreaks of food poisoning. And to state the obvious, there is no central planning of this network. There's no five-year plan setting out quotas of egg production. There's no piggery plan. The heavy lifting is done by a whole heap of operators, public and private, each seeking to expand opportunities where they exist. And the results are resounding. The abundance of options in our food system is in stark contrast to the limited options in centrally planned systems. We rarely run out of food, even during natural disasters. We know how to create massively complex systems that touch every single person in society. We just don't do it for waste. Why? Well, for one, it's not really economic to do much differently. The stuff's all mixed up, and then there's that complexity thing. Actually, the first two are pretty much solvable with the natural evolution of technology. Take, take aluminium. Aluminium was once so precious 
that Napoleon III gave aluminium cutlery to his most important guests, and the rest used mere silver. <laughs> of course, we now know aluminium is at disposable drink packaging. Technology can do a lot of things if we make it, but we will always be tripped up by complexity. And it's given complexity that it's kind of understandable that we turn to the government and we default to the simplest solution we can sustain to make sure we don't have a public health problem, even if it really sucks as a solution, like burying it all in the ground or burning it all. It works. And it's this thing of simplicity versus complexity that brings us to the nub of the problem. Waste is simply too complex to understand in any meaningful way. Not just hard to understand, not needing better models or more precise data to enable prediction, it cannot be known. So what do we do? Let's return quickly to Prague and Berlin. The abundance of car DV was not because a good model mapped it all out. That sort of central planning led to the Spartan Prague department store. Instead, CARDV's abundance of options, that rich complexity, was created by a swarm of individual optimizers, each seeking to sell their wares in the most iconic department store in the Western world. Maybe that abundance is the key. Maybe, just maybe, we need to not just survive on complexity, but thrive if we are to do any better with waste. Maybe we need the emergence of a swarm of waste entrepreneurs, each seeking, each operating in concert around a common narrative to recognize the importance of storytelling. In waste, that story might be a world without waste, a world in which everything we throw out is an opportunity for somebody else to reprocess it, a world in which we create new business models to provide for the same needs without producing the same wastes. For we, if we are bold enough in our vision, if that light is bright enough, then we create something around which we can weave a million tales, a new world. For it's true, we actually create the world by the stories we tell each other about it. But of course, a common story does not in itself make a swarm. For that, you need independent thinking and action towards that goal too. It's independent action that lets us take on complexity. The book The Power of Pool by John Seeley Brown, John Hagel and Lang Davison describes one way of operating in a fast-moving and complex world. In that book, the authors argue that competitive advantage is no longer based on having stocks of knowledge that we sell, but is instead based on having access to flows of knowledge that we tap. We ride the wild horse that is complexity, rather than attempt to corral it. So how do we do this? Well, the authors introduced the idea of scalable learning, systems where we learn deliberately and quickly, creating spaces where the answers are not known, but sought, where we share knowledge to gain new insights, where we are happy with the imperfect, provided it can be rapidly modified. Scalable learning works because it recognizes that there is so much opportunity, and that the only way to access that opportunity is through the collective insights of networks of people, to take many ideas, rub them together and see what comes of it. You can develop this idea further with the work of Nicholas Nassim Taleb in the Anti-Fragile. His Anti-Fragile is a system that's not just robust in the face of change, but is strengthened through change, something that thrives on complexity, kind of applied scalable learning. The anti-fragile is an iterative world that optimizes for unlikely leaps forward whilst at the same time guarding against catastrophic failure. It's about taking a whole heap of small bets, protecting against yourself against disaster by their small size, but at the same time experimenting with lots of unproven ideas on the small odds of an upside. All those crazy ideas that will never work out. It's about fostering an incessant sense of curiosity, about looking for insights in stuff that's barely relevant, about stepping outside the comfort zone, because the stuff that is comfortable is a cul-de-sac of epic proportions, for it's out there in the badlands, haunted by sun-touched madmen, that you'll find opportunity. Untapped, 
unexpected, glorious. It is not a sensible solution that comes from the top by the wise heads. It's a series of nutcase solutions formed from the aggregate actions of many players. It's ideas stretched and shared and grown through the connection economy, that thing that is all around us. All those people with their noses in their smartphones, tweeting and posting and blogging and sharing, they are all building connections. And from connections come wealth. That has always been true. What is new is the ease of connection. So no longer is the best connected with the right surname or the source school type, but is instead the person who is most free with knowledge. It's the gift economy, and it's wonderfully elegant. In creating wealth and connections by sharing knowledge, we are also creating a world in which the most amateur can outstrip the seasoned professional, because the amateur knows most of what the professional knows, but doesn't carry the baggage of what is impossible. By freely sharing knowledge, we become the beneficiary of something much larger than what we are shared. It's called serendipity, and it's a thing. It's that moment when one of the many seeds you have cast bears the most beautiful harvest, and it does so perfectly coincidentally and in the most wonderful way. Serendipity and the, and the gift economy and learning will power everything that I'm talking about. They foster this immense sense of abundance, this sense that the idea is to unlock new opportunities rather than protect current ones. So what does a world without waste look like? Well, for one, a world without waste refuses to accept waste. Waste is a waste, not just a, a waste of resources to be sure, but also a waste of potential ingenuity. The sort of thinking that we need to turn waste into byproducts is equally important to take on even more challenging problems. A world without waste is a world of abundance, and to find abundance, we need to change the story we tell each other about waste. We do not have millions of tons of waste to be managed with minimum harm. Instead, we have thousands of many different byproducts, each an opportunity, each to be developed with maximum value. A world without waste is a world in which we take on complexity through rapid learning of events like these that spark ideas, which lead to heresies, which create grand explosions of diversity, where passion and curiosity reign over efficiency. A world without waste is a world of courage, great and small, being bold enough to accept insights, to try new ideas, to be an amateur, to step outside your comfort zone. In short, a world without waste is a world of serendipity, and of beauty, a fundamentally democratic and vibrant and thriving world, a world you create through your actions, be they great or small. This isn't about deciding which bin to put your apple core in. This is life. This is for you to make. It's being part of a web so incredible, so powerful, so goddamn awesome that we, that we change the world. <laughs>